number two, mister. Let me check. 1700 West Hillsdale Boulevard. It's pretty hard to turn a business trip into a pleasure trip, but you can make it more productive. With a portable computer, I can check my appointments, work on a script, ship it via modem, even agonize over the show's budget. How good are these portable computers? We'll find out next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Popular Computing, the authoritative microcomputer magazine from McGraw-Hill. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. This is Gary Kildall, and the subject is portables. Gary, we're going to be talking about things like transportables and lap portables, but I want to show you this portable over here. This looks like a pretty small computer, but in fact, this is just the keyboard. I can program my things into my computer, and in fact, this is the computer, and of course, it is now a wrist portable. Mm. Now, I don't know whether this does anything very useful or not. In fact, that's my question about this whole subject of portables. Is this another case of technology in search of a purpose? I don't think so, Stuart. Uh, it's just a new dimension in technology. We have had faster processors, more memory, and so forth in the past. Now what we're looking for is trying to get all that speed and power into a smaller package. Uh, portables really are a way that you can do personal computing and self-contained computing, uh, let's say on an airplane, uh, working with programs, working with spreadsheets, and then use, say, a stationary computer, if we can call it that, to uh, communicate our programs and then work with large database systems or faster printers. Okay, Gary, we're going to be seeing some of the most exciting new portables out now, the new Data General 1. We'll see the Texas Instruments ProLite, the Pivot from Morrow. And we'll also see the new Integral PC from HP. Now, what do people really do with portables? Reporter Wendy Woods checks it out. If a desktop computer's home is a desk, where does the portable computer call home? In the case of a battery-powered lab computer, almost anywhere you can carry it will do. The secret to the expanding success of the traveling micro is its ability to record and provide information on the spot and transmit that data electronically. Up until now, the principal buyers of portables have been journalists and other people who spend most of their jobs on the road. But the uses of such a machine are growing and are limited only by the ingenuity of the owner and the computer's ability to interface with desk-bound micros. Mike Lynch puts his lab computer to work collecting up-to-date travel information from around the world and phoning it regularly into his home computer in California. Travel agents and airline personnel can then retrieve this information by calling Mike's home computer. The weather, currency exchange, special events, and special bargains then become available to other travelers almost immediately. It's a task that's perfectly suited to a portable, since the news changes frequently, and he can update and add to his database as often as he likes with just a telephone call. While most of the portables available today are far less powerful than the typical home or office machine, they are quickly catching up in both memory capacity and software variety. Equipped with disk drives and large screens, a few can just about match the performance of desk-bound micros. But the future of the portable is not all that clear. If an electronic briefcase is revolutionary for some, it might just be another piece of luggage for others. Joining us now is Roland Archer, who's the manager of software development and data general, and Faris Gaffney, who's the manager of product marketing at Texas Instruments. Gary. Stuart, you know what makes portables really exciting is that a machine this capable, say 20 years ago, would have filled the whole room. So uh, there's a lot of technology that's caused all this to happen. Just exactly what's gone on? Well, there's been a lot of things that have happened, Gary. Uh, one of the main areas that have allowed us to put the power of a desktop computer into a briefcase-sized machine is in the LCD. And I did bring along uh, an LCD screen outside of its case to show your viewers uh, what the unit looks like. 
And one of the key things is not only the ability to, to make an LCD this large, but also the special controllers that are needed in order to control an LCD this now, large. Roland, this is, a, this is the same kind of a size of display as a standard, uh, say, cathode ray tube display, a CRT That's display. right. It has 80 okay. by 25 characters mm -hmm. and 640 by 256 pixels for graphics. Okay, now Roland, that's a major advancement in the in the data general one. Mm -hmm. What technology did it take to get you to come up with the full screen size? Well, in order to come up with a screen this large, we approached several Japanese vendors through our Japanese subsidiary, Nippon Data General. Uh, let me put this down for a moment. And they, uh, at the time that we approached them, they had just finished their 16-line displays, so they were n not very interested in right away starting mm -hmm. with a 24 and 25 line. We were able to convince them of the importance of that for the Japanese marketplace. Uh, Isn't it true also that the Japanese have, uh, were really pioneers in, say, the CMOS uh, parts Yeah, as well? the other main, main area that has come together in, to allow a battery-powered portable is the CMOS, which is a low-powered uh, mm -hmm. logic family. And in fact, here I have, this is the main brain, uh, the CPU that is inside the Data General 1. And again, you see all these components are CMOS, and not only uh, are they CMOS, but they're surface mount, which means if you look at a traditional component, uh, which tends to have the pins and plugs into a socket. This instead is laser soldered so onto the board. this gives you a lower profile on the parts themselves. We can actually mount this, the parts on both sides. Is this the sides. memory here on one side? This is all the memory. There's 128K okay. bytes so of there's memory in this So there's 128K right in this little area that's right, right here. That's okay. right. And these two gate arrays control the screen as well. Mm -hmm. On your screen again, Roland, yes. didn't you in fact approach the problem by in fact having a bunch of subscreens which you're kind of running simultaneously? Well, that's part of what you have to do. The, uh, the screen is divided uh, conceptually to the logic into two components, and those two components are controlled together by the gate array controllers, and they're, you get quite a smooth effect of scrolling up from one end to the other. I can start something running here while we're talking about some other things. Okay. Now, uh, Ferris may have a comment on this. That uh, one of the things that's pretty obvious when you see these screens is that they are black and white, and uh, it seems like a lot of uh, you know the applications these days are involving color. Do we see any uh, directions there? Uh, okay, can I show you my ProLite computer? From <laughs> give Texas give, give it a competition equal time. Here. <laughs> okay, uh, we introduced this machine in November. And uh, as Roland's machine, we do have a full screen LCD, mm -hmm. which is the uh, primary driving force in letting this machine be available now. It is full screen, 25 lines by 80 columns. And as Gary mentioned, you cannot get LCDs in color. But uh, you can still do a lot of useful work in black and white screens. We've targeted the machine primarily at people whose job is in the field, such as salesmen, insurance agents, uh, service representatives and they've been looking for PC power and a true portable that they can carry around. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've now provided that. We so do they use these as a, as a primary computing device, or do they use it sort of as a peripheral in the sense that they go on, off on an airplane and do some computing and then come back and connect to that? Well, I think there are two uses. One is as a general productivity aid, just to help them do their job better, be more efficient in order entry and communications with the factory. The other is the new wave of applications that are requiring computer technology to be able to solve a problem, such as universal life insurance. It's a very complex cell and it involves a lot of what-if analysis mm -hmm. and uh, allowing, this, allowing this to be done at the client's site now on a portable is a major step forward. But doesn't that require, does that require, a, a, say, a larger uh, storage system, some sort of mass storage devices beyond floppies or not? Uh, no, not really. Now, what we have done, another new technology that uh, we didn't mention was the advent of the 256K RAM chip. Mm -hmm. That allows us to put 768K of user RAM memory in this machine. So we've not sacrificed anything as far as desktop PC functionality. Yeah. When, you get, uh, when, you, when you're working with these machines, how much, say, uh, backup storage do you have to work with generally? Okay, now we can have either one or two disk drives. Mm -hmm. Another new technology that we've both incorporated is the uh, new three and a half inch diskettes, mm -hmm. uh, micro floppy drives. We can either put one or two on this machine, and it has double the storage of the five and a quarter drives. It's actually twice the storage. Yeah, I think that's one of the key points when you compare these to a desktop computer is that you have in this little floppy, you have 720k bytes of storage, so inside the unit, you have the ability to have one and a half megabytes of storage, which is really enough for most applications, considering the number that are doing it today with just two drives totaling 720k. Speaking of databases, how about uh, modems and communications? Can these both run as terminals? you have modems built in, or is that an accessory? Yeah, we have a 300 baud internal modem option, and it fits right inside the unit, so you don't have to add anything outside. And we also have a terminal emulator built in. A lot of our customers use this as a terminal on a data general system, plus a workstation, and something that you can take home in the evening or take on the road with you.
and on the prolate? Yes, we've taken a modular approach to this. Our modem is a uh, user installable option, and there are also another option slot here available. And we think that uh, value-added type applications where somebody will do a special interface board to interface a particular piece of equipment uh, is going to be a big plus for us. The modem, of course, is very important for the guy whose job is in the field. He'll be uploading and downloading data from a host computer at some point. Looking at the screen, and the, I want to ask about the memory demands of these screens. For instance, I think on your machine, on the Data General one, you've got 128K, but I think you're tying up 48K just running the screen. That's Tell right. Tell me about that problem. That's right. In order to, to uh, refresh an LCD screen, you actually need an area of memory dedicated to that function. So we have 48K in order to get the high-resolution graphics that you see there. And also, we've emulated uh, the same display adapter devices that IBM PC software expect to see. So software that writes directly into that screen memory still functions on the Data General 1. Now, these, uh, one of, this brings up a, um, a point is if we start with 128K, it seems like the sort of the standard size nowadays is 256K. Mm -hmm. um, and also, one drive seems to be some limitation. Now, what about pricing? How does this all fit? This, this low-end system, is this kind of a bait-and-switch strategy? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, quite a few third-party software packages that will run in the 128K system, mm -hmm. so it didn't make sense not to offer that. Mm -hmm. uh, and similarly with the one drive, but of course since the one drive holds twice the capacity of a five and a quarter inch floppy, a lot of programs, for example, Lotus took their IBM PC version and fit it all onto one diskette, so you don't have to do any diskette swapping. Uh, and memory-wise, if you want more memory, we'll be happy to sell it to you. <laughs> what what just we, in general, what, what kind of price range yeah, are we talking about? Our base unit mm -hmm. is 2895 with 128 K bytes and one mm -hmm. 720 KB floppy. Okay, and then if we run it up to say, let's let's say a uh, quarter megabyte, 256K with two drives, what are we right. running then? That's a 4095 system right okay. now, Gary. And on the okay. TI? Okay, I, uh, we started at 256K. Uh, our machine with one drive and 256K is 2995, again expandable to 768. And we incorporated the screen memory in the LCD drivers themselves. So uh, we also went through a lot of uh, uh, perturbations on how to drive the LCD. and. Uh, one of the responses was we, some people think LCDs are slow, and we've put a lot of effort into making our LCD response time comparable to a CRT because we drive it just like a CRT. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. Now, next we're going to take a look at a portable that has standard five and a quarter inch mini floppy in it, and we'll take a look at a new 32-bit portable that runs Unix, so stay with us. Joining us now is Srini Nagashwar. Srini is the retail marketing manager of the personal computer division at Hewlett Packard, and George Morrow, who is chairman and founder of Morrow Computers. And we're going to be looking at some very spectacular portables here in just a moment. First, though, as many of these portables come out, they all, of course, have hopes of great success, but there have been some significant failures in the portables, and Wendy Woods has a report on one of them. Gavelin's briefcase size portable with a 3-inch drive, an 8-line display, a modem, a printer, and a 7-hour battery life made a flashy entrance in a limousine in the spring of 83 and appeared to be the machine that everyone was waiting for. The company saw an open road to success. What Gavelin didn't see is that it was caught in a fast-changing industry where a 3.5-inch drive, IBM compatibility, and a 16-line display were becoming the standard. Gavelin delayed production for a year to re-engineer its portable, a fatal mistake. It's unfortunately a classic case of having state-of-the-art technology, having a really wonderful machine, having probably the best sales staff I've ever seen in the business. They had the best of everything, but they missed the window of opportunity. Their product was too late getting into the market. Can I hear 200? Can I, you're looking at a $3,000 machine. Can I hear $200? Gavelin went bankrupt last year, having sold only about a thousand of the machines. Its final auction became a sad lesson for the entire industry. The leaders, in a technological sense, frequently just either don't have enough funding, or they miss their window, or they just, the market timing is not quite right, and they don't make money from it. But, in terms of the impact on the portable computer market, they advance the technology. They contributed greatly. Gavelin wasn't the first portable computer maker to go under, but it certainly was one of the most expensive failures. More than $31 million in venture capital went into this company during its short life. All of it was lost because Gavelin was a victim of bad timing. Reporting for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. 
Well, a story like that makes me uh, glad I'm in the software business, <laughs> right? Um, it just really shows that there are lots of different components that make up the success of a small computer system. And in the case of portables, it seems to me the display has to improve considerably. Uh, at least in my own experience, sitting on an airplane, getting light from different directions, that it'll fade, uh, become unusable at a certain point. I'm kind of interested to see what, where this display technology is going. We've got a couple of examples here. And uh, George? Well, your liquid crystal display technology uses existing light to give you visual information. And uh, the electroluminescent type, or the CRT, gives this you... This is the machine you're referring to as the machine that's that Srini right. brought with him. It uh, uh, has the... Uh, it has an electroluminescent uh, display. display. Mm -hmm. Compared it to the LCDs, which are on the first machines we looked at in the show. Right. That's right. These displays use its own, their own power. They chew up power to create light so that you can look at it. Uh, in a uh, low ambient light environment, they're excellent. In a high ambi ambient light environment, the liquid crystal is a lot better than uh, the present generation of uh, electroluminescent. Now, how do you cover both those problems? Well, one way to cover both those problems is you, you backlight your LCDs with some electroluminescence. Understand, these technologies are in an evolving state. Your electroluminescent is going to get more efficient. That means it will give you more light for less power. And your uh, liquid crystals are going to get the contrast is going to improve as time goes on which will give you more visual uh, feedback for a given uh, amount of uh, incident light. Now, what about the, uh, the work that the Japanese are doing? For example, the new Casio TV is a color TV that has a li liquid crystal display. Are we going to see that move into, let's say, a small Well, the, the whole development of liquid crystal displays in Japan, as far as I'm concerned, is aimed toward flat panel televisions. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't make it, what we're going, the stage they'll get to will be perfectly acceptable for good graphics and good contrast. As a matter of fact, I believe these machines, in a year from now, you'll be able to have color. You'll have liquid crystals that will give you at least two colors. And mm -hmm. this is going to be great for this graphics. This eliminates all the uh, uh, big tubes and the That's high, right. big power supplies. That's and right. And all those, the masks and the, and the tremendous number of uh, stages that uh, these uh, color uh, television sets go through now. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you both to do something here? If you can punch a couple buttons so we could see what that ELD display looks like while we're talking here, Srini. Uh, and George, you have your pivot with That's you. Right. Why don't you show us uh, what that is and how it differs from the other right. machines we've seen? Well, it differs in a couple of ways. Uh, it uses an LCD just like a lot of the other machines. It does have one thing that uh, the rest of the machines don't have, and that's a five and a quarter inch disc. Uh, either you don't have a disc like the HP people and they expect to carry your stuff around in ROM, or they have three and a half inch discs. Now, if you go out and buy Lotus for $500, you'll find that if you don't have a pair of scissors with you, you're going to have to spend another $300 on your three and a half inch version of Lotus. If I can interrupt a second, I just want to take a look at the pictures that are being painted on the ELD, which is interesting. It's very impressive. Huh? <clears throat> but. Uh, now, this is a, a fixed dis um, yeah. demonstration. It's that, a fixed demonstration uh -huh. okay. we see of that. a space shuttle. And right. you can and see you the thing being moved around. And you can actually, in your hotel room, design airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, yes. Right. If you have nothing better to do. Right? <laughs> Let's go on to another topic, and this, uh, that's the, uh, the backup storage technology. We're, we're dealing here with a, uh, a, a device that's, that's become very semiconductor oriented, that's the right. RAMs and so forth, the LCD display and so forth. But now we have a mechanical device and a floppy disk drive. What's going to happen as far as backup storage? Well, uh, backup storage, being able to carry your work around with you, and the HP machine, you carry it around in CMOS static RAM. Mm -hmm. It's low power, and it has a lead-acid battery that keeps it alive. In this machine, just like your PC, you carry it around in your floppy. It does take more power, and it does produce more weight. But we feel that the function that it gives you, you're carrying around a standard environment. Nothing could be more standard than this. Actually, Gary, I think to a large extent, storage issues uh, are affected, I think, by two parameters. Uh, one is the fact that as we d uh, were designing the portable and when we decided not to uh, put in a three and a half inch disk drive, there were two things that, uh, that, that made us do that. One is when you carry these machines around, you really want instant availability. What that says is uh, uh, very often what I do is I'm sitting at an airport waiting for a plane to take off and I'm f finishing up my travel expense report while I'm doing that and I don't want to load up a disk and start 
you know, a spreadsheet and so on. Sometimes I think the best place to sell these would be at the airport terminals. That's, uh, I think so too. That's where people use them quite a lot. Well, so I, that's one, one aspect. I've, I've been in airports a long time and I don't see very many of these machines in airports. I, occasionally I see someone with a, yeah. a, a quite a list to themselves carrying around a compact, but aside from that, why? So, so we do I don't see people using them in airplanes well, well, or yeah. at airports. Well, what is the real market? We talked about so, that yeah. at the beginning. I mean, what do you need portables for? There are two things that, that, that we think you need portables for, Stuart. We try to break the market into two parts composed of one set of people who basically take work away from their desk and the other set of people who work away from their desk. Uh, and in the first category, you essentially have managers, executives, and professionals like some of us here. And in the second category, you have the insurance salesmen or, you know, salesmen of various categories. And people who typically take work away from their desk are usually running, running spreadsheets or word processing or memo maker or whatever uh, on there. And those are the kinds of programs you need. We don't think that you need a huge suite of programs to run on portables. And you basically want the basic stuff running and be available to you instantly. The, uh, the other thing that we think is extremely important is that these people who travel around, uh, you know, they are really abusing their machine quite a bit. You know, it ends up in boots of cars and underneath your airplane seat and so on. So these machines have to put up with a lot of vibration. Uh, like our machine can take 100 Gs on six sides. We have just a, a couple of minutes left. I want to get to follow up on Gary's point on, and you mentioned, George, on the CMOS technology. There's a major difference between the HP 110 and yours in... In, in, the, in the memory that we use. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, the, and, and the we're, using, it we're power. using standard NMOS uh, dynamic RAM. It does use more power. What we will move to later this year is a CMOS, CMOS dynamic RAM, and it offers a power reduction of about a factor of eight. It uh, is probably the best compromise of CMOS static and NMOS dynamic. It gives you the ability to get to low cost because it doesn't use as much silicon area, yet it, uh, the energy, the amount of power it uses is virtually the same as uh, CMOS static. Uh, George, you've been known for the low prices, and I'd kind of be interested <laughs> to see what, uh, what the price of this one is. Well, this, uh, this starts out in 1995, okay. and I believe these machines ought to start out at about $1,000 mm -hmm. with at least one drive. So that 1995 is with the one? One drive and 128K of memory. They, the natural price for these things is somewhere, a very high-end machine with a very dense display with all sorts of bells and whistles should be around 2000 and a good utilitarian machine should be around 1000 Srini, where are we on the prices of these two quickly? Uh, yeah, the R Portable, which includes all the software, goes at, uh, which includes about $1,000 worth of software, goes for $29.95. Uh, and this particular machine, which is really an AC-powered machine, which has the Unix operating system, but it's the first transportable Unix, floppy-based Unix system, uh, goes for $49.95. You know, I want to touch, quick, on, George, I wanna touch on this business of uh, transportability and how much abuse a machine has to take. Uh, I, think, uh, the, uh, I think we have a history that these floppies stand up pretty good in moving around because Kpro has probably produced hundreds of thousands of these things and Osborne before them produced a lot of them, and those machines are kicked around probably as much as a machine gets yeah, kicked George, around. That, that raises a point that this whole definition of portable is really a question when we're talking about portables, and we have a commentary yes. on that subject from Paul Schindler. You know, it's pretty easy to tell what's a portable computer. Now, this is a sewing machine. You know, it's about the same size and weight as a lot of popular computers that call themselves portables. But if you were going to sew away from the house, would you carry your sewing machine? No, I don't think so. I think you'd take a needle. You wouldn't be able to do any fancy sewing, and you wouldn't be able to do it very quickly, but you'd be trading functionality for portability. Well, the same thing goes for computers. Now, this is my portable computer. I've been using it for a couple of years. It won't run CPM programs, but I don't need CPM programs. It does the job for me. It's light. It runs on batteries, not an extension cord. There's going to be a raging argument about what's portable when all of us are six feet underground. I say you need a full-size keyboard, at least 240 characters on the screen, and several hours worth of running on the internal battery. Plus, it should fit in a briefcase. Now, there's a few computers like that on the market, but I don't think there's going to be very many more, and I'll tell you why. Most of the people who need true portability are journalists, and most of us who can afford a portable already have one. So my fearless prediction for the future is more sewing machine computers and fewer briefcase computers. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler.
In the random access file this week, a small company in California says it has come up with a new design for a computer chip that will enable microcomputers to run at mainframe speeds. The new Novix chip, called the NC4000, reportedly runs 10 times faster than the Motorola 68000, today's fastest 16-bit chip. The chip has 80% fewer components than traditional chips and uses the efficient fourth as its machine language. Japan's NEC Corporation has announced the development of a new optical disk storage system that uses organic dyes rather than metal as in conventional optical disks. NEC says the breakthrough means disks can now be produced at one-tenth the cost of metallic-based laser disks. The new organic dye material may also speed up the development of read-write optical disks for computer storage. Digital Systems has announced a new software broadcast service called Softcast. The company will distribute radio programs to over a thousand stations across the country. The programs will include computer data, both software and text. The company plans to sell software over the radio network and to provide the first broadcast-based computer information service. Ziv Davis, the publishing company, has announced a new daily newsletter to be distributed exclusively via computer terminals. It'll be called the Computer Industry Newsletter, edited by well-known industry analyst Esther Dyson. The newsletter will be fed to terminals every night at 6 p.m. Hints from IBM last week that there indeed may be a replacement product for the now-defunct PC Junior. An IBM senior vice president said IBM is working on a new low-cost computer. And there are continuing rumors that IBM may introduce its IBM JX, a low-cost computer currently being sold only in Japan. The IBM exec also said Big Blue will begin producing its own hard disk drives in an effort to solve the drive problems on the AT. Paul Schindler is back now with this week's software review. I write for this magazine, and I want to tell you finding stories and back issues can be a real pain. That's why I index them by topic. And the program I use to help me is DBase 3. Now, sure, there have been other database managers in my life, simpler ones, including even DBase 2 now and then. DBase 3 isn't for everyone. It's complicated and, for the novice, intimidating. But I want to give credit to the people at Ashton Tate. DBase 3 is a lot less intimidating than DBase 2. What DBase 3 is is powerful. You have a complicated job, you want to get done fast in a relational database, this could be your answer. Now, there isn't a lot to be said about database managers, and they aren't usually much to look at. Since a lot of you have seen or used DBase2, I want to show you the biggest change, the assist function. Instead of having to start from scratch every time you compose a command, you get help from menus. As it says in the documentation, we all know real programmers don't use menus, but we also know that most of us aren't real programmers. DBase 3 from Ashton Tate in Culver City, California is the complicated, powerful $700 database manager for the rest of us. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. A company called Dana Communications has come up with a solution for those of you who can't decide whether you want to buy an IBM PC or an Apple Macintosh. The new product, called Mac Charlie, lets you turn either one into the other, enabling Mac users to run PC software and allowing PC users to take advantage of Mac's mouse, graphics, and friendly user interface. The Mac Charlie hardware software package will cost about $1,200. Koala is out with a new mouse substitute called the Koala Cat. It's a touch-sensitive pad which replaces the mouse. You use your finger on the pad to move the cursor. Koala says its new cat lets you do all the usual mouse moves without needing a lot of desk space for a mouse. Finally, the California Department of Motor Vehicles is in the process of converting to a fully computerized system, and you know what that means. The California DMV says it now has a backlog of 87,000 transactions, and the backlog is growing by 20,000 a month. Thousands of California drivers are stuck with expired car registrations and driver's licenses. The DMV said it grossly underestimated the problems of converting to a computer system. It's now asking for $5 million to hire more than 100 people and to pay for overtime so that good old human beings can clean up the mess created by the new computer system. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.